the peace, that we ensure that the structures that exist to, to make sure that we have sustained elections and that the elections actually translate into the democracy that we want as Ghanaians, 63 years after, after independence, we actually get it. So on this note, I am grateful to be here to represent um, my, my team, and I wish you a very good meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Teiko. Thank you so much. And uh, this two-way social contract of you know, what Ghana can do for us and what we do for Ghana, you know, it's a two-way contract. So the other one also has to do its bit, isn't it? I think that's really the most important aspect of the whole conversation. So many a times when we quote this, um, it's targeted at encouraging the citizens to give to the country. But then again, the, the institutions, as you mentioned, the country also has to do what has to be done to encourage the citizens to also do what they have to do. I'm sure we're all on the right page, right? It's a contract. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, but on this note, I would want to acknowledge a few persons who have joined us um, to help us have this conversation. Of, of course, those of you who are watching us on television, you are an integral part of this whole conversation as well, and we thank you for joining us. We're also live on 3FM 92.7, on Onia 95.1, on Connect FM 97.1 in Takrade and beyond, also on Akuma FM 87.5 in Kumasi and beyond as well. We're live on 3news.com, all across the world, on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, and DSTV channel 279. So, together with those of you who are here, we have a global audience who are also very much interested in this conversation that we're having today. Let me acknowledge the presence of Mr. In fact, Dr. Delali Kwesi Brimpong, who was then Mr. Delali uh, Kwesi Brimpong, who was then the candidate of the NDC during the by-election. The Ayawaso West Wagon by election. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. And we're indeed extremely grateful that you made it. We also have another candidate who also stood on the ticket of the PPP in the Ayawaso West Wagon constituency, Mr. William Duokbo, as well here. Thank you very much. And mostly, we go to church on the 31st of December, we cross over to 1st January, if you're a Christian. But there's one person who prepares to celebrate his birthday on the 1st of January. He's one of few people I know who celebrates his birthday on the 1st of January. Mr. Alex Sebefia, a former health minister, and former <laughs> deputy chief of staff in the ex Mahama and Mills administration is also here. The Kakri Samoa as well. Uh, here with us. Please, let's put our hands together for them. We're expecting all the others from the various political parties uh, to join us uh, as we do this together. I'll be acknowledging a number of you as we go on as well. I, I see many of you here and, and thank you for making it. I would introduce the chairman and he would in turn give his remarks and also go ahead to introduce the keynote speaker for this conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, our chairman for this all-important occasion is Mr. Francis Kweku Poku. He schooled at Opokuari Secondary School. He also attended the University of Ghana, Legon, and graduated in French with Latin as a subsidiary subject. After graduation, he worked in the security services of Ghana and served in seven administrations from 2008, I beg your pardon, from 2001 to 2008. He was Ghana's national security coordinator and cabinet minister responsible for national security. In 2006, he was awarded Ghana's most distinguished national honor known as the Order of Volta for his substantial contribution for peace and stability in Ghana and West Africa. He is resident in the UK, where he was appointed the Chief Executive Officer of two UK companies, Africa Reconcile Limited and the Catholic Light Limited. 
He is a parishioner of the Church of Trans Transfiguration, Kensal Rise. He was appointed by the Archdiocese of Westminster as the chairman of the Africa Catholic Mission, a body responsible for coordinating the work of African chaplaincies in the UK. He is also the Catholic Church representative on the Ghana Christian Council in the UK. He has been married for 42 years with six children and nine grandchildren. Ladies and gentlemen, round of applause as we welcome. Please, let's put our hands together for our chairman, Mr. Francis Kwekupoku. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Indeed, we are very grateful to Star Ghana for promoting this meeting. And it's appropriate that we review the political scene of Ghana before December. I think we are all witnesses to what is going on in West Africa. There's no good story anywhere. And if we can do so, we have to unite our policies does not matter which side you belong to. But I'm encouraged by the political leadership of this country. I look at the president, who was a, a group, who was a colleague at the University of Ghana, and uh, our late Professor Mills, we are all contemporaries. And then, um, we know the NDC flag bearer, Yomahama. He was, he's been uh, in parliament with the current president. And in parliament, there is a lot of coordination when it comes to enactment of policies. And we know our parliamentarians are very excellent. They know how to work, how to do things across board and arrive at consensus. So the leadership is to be commended, and there is every expectation that if we are all working very well, we should be able to arrive at consensus. But there are issues that we should not brush aside. Talking about vigilantes, we have been saddled with the problem of foot soldiers ever since I joined the security service. The truth of the matter is that before elections, foot soldiers are needed for the whole electoral process. But my advice to all the political parties is that they should concede the existence of these foot soldiers. They are not animals that you use as and when you wish. These are Ghanaians, human beings, who are needed for a purpose. If that is the case, then there should be a consensus for properly registering the food soldiers, acknowledging them, and work out a scheme for sustaining them both before and during elections. We should not pretend that they do not exist. So if I'm going to be an advocate for food soldiers, what I would say is that they deserve a role in the political process, but they should be properly registered, properly controlled. And then the parties will have to work out a scheme for sustaining these soldiers, these soldiers when they are not in power and out of power. So they are human beings, they are Ghanaians, they have no voice, but they've existed ever since I have been in the security service. They play a very important role for all the political parties. Now, we seem to be graduating them into vigilantes. What that word means, I cannot understand. They are full soldiers. They are properly acknowledged by all political parties. But they need to be controlled. They need to be treated as human beings. If we don't, what is going to happen is that they are going to be used not just 
against the opposing parties, but they will turn against the political groups that are not looking after them. So they will become a time bomb. Let's not look at particular events, like the events of uh, Ayaso West Wogon. That's an event. It has to be addressed. But then the underlying causes must be addressed. That is the existence of food soldiers, which we are all refusing to acknowledge, which the political parties are refusing to acknowledge. So my dear Ghanaians, let's be truthful. Let's acknowledge what is wrong in our midst. Let us, on a non-partisan basis, try to find solutions. I believe we are getting there. The political process is encouraging. There will be mistakes. And all political parties will make mistakes. But let us be objective and find solutions. I'm encouraged today because I'm assured that there are enough good people here who will come out with solution so that we will encourage all the parties to subscribe to nonviolence come 2020. And this is a process not affecting just the political parties. It's for the whole civil society. We want Ghanaians to be involved in the process. And we want all groups, faith groups, NGOs, everybody, they are all part of the process. It's not a question of stigmatization. We need to find solutions objectively as Ghanaians because peace is good for all of us. It does not matter who emerges, but then let's get the political environment right so that we can all contribute to the well-being of this country. Thank you very much. And I'm pleased to have this as the speaker, Dr. Ike Abuchi. Incidentally, when I joined the police service, his father was the one who took, her from, took over from me when I was posted to a flower in the water region. So um, I know his late father, and I'm very proud of his achievements, and he has played a very important role both within uh, the law establishment and also his contribution to civil society. I hope that he will lead us to find a solution given the experience he had during the commission of, of inquiry that took place after Ayawa's West. Thank you very much, my brother. Distinguished Chair, former Ministers of State, fellow Ghanaians, I'm honored to present this short speech or lecture on promoting stability, electoral violence, and the elections 2020. I have always reacted with skepticism these days when I'm invited by the media to speak on anything related to elections and security for that matter. Now for these invitations, I've always come as I have thought with ulterior motives. They are intended to exact comments from me about the commission's work on the Ayawasu incident and therefore to comment post the white paper Permit me to state, therefore, at the outset, that I'm not here to speak on the work of the Emil Short Commission. I will therefore resist the temptation from anyone who have graced this occasion with a prepared intention to deconstruct the work of the Commission and consequently the government white paper that was issued on it. 
with that in mind, and out of the way, I have the peace of mind, particularly because the chairman himself has said we should move beyond Ayawaso. For the challenges that confront us as a country are way bigger than what happened in Ayawaso. Although I concede that Ayawaso represents a microcosm through which we can see what is ahead of us. Mr. Chairman, when we decided to adopt democracy in 1992, we chose a path of leadership that places the choice of our leaders in our hands, not one that will put our national security in jeopardy once every four years. I say this carefully because when we elected our first leaders in 1992, we did that with the joy of having been participants. We did not do that, bearing in mind that after every four years when we have to go to the polls, we have to be afraid for our lives. In choosing democracy, therefore, we implicitly prized ideas over silence. We chose dissent over consensus. We upheld participation over one-man rule. We prized majoritarian leadership with accommodation over the whims and caprices of leadership of the few or elites. For if democracy, of the, if, for if democracy is the rule of the majority, it is because of the assumption that the view of the majority is richer than those of the few. And this also rests on the assumption that the majority are likely to often get it right than the fewer in number. This is the origins of the Latin expression, vox populi, vox deo, the voice of the people is the voice of God, in which the voice of the majority is equated to that, to that of God himself. As a government based on ideas in which people compete for the attention of the electorate, democracy is said to thrive on the marketplace of ideas. Ideas in which candidates for office aspire for service by selling policies they intend to pursue or wooing the electorate by articulating their competences and vision. This marketplace sells ideas as the core ingredient and the capacity to persuade is the cherished talent. Distinguished Chairman, as I will later stress in this lecture, the death of this marketplace is the ultimate brainchild of electoral and political violence in Ghana. For when political parties are deprived of the ideas to propagate, they have to compete in something else. And that something else is their capacity to show how violent they can be and outdo each other in violence. For this marketplace of ideas inspires and energizes policies and programs and forces our political actors to devise alternative causes of action as answers to our many problems as a country. Kill it and you promote competition in violence rather than thought and creative reflection. Kill it, and you foment the creation of groups who both have the aim and wherewithal to inspire fear and suppression in a country's political life. If governance is all about solving the basic problems that confront a people, then surely politics should be about providing the mechanisms or instruments for solving those problems. And has, been, and has been shown through the ancient Greek political theory that critical political thinking births ideas that solve the daily problems of our societies. Yet the marketplace of ideas, like all marketplaces, need good stuff on sale. And accordingly, bad and toxic ideas corrupt, and corrupt the hygiene of the market space. Indecency and foul language, rabble-rousing, and generally negative communication within a public space undermine the spirit of democracy and endangers, sorry, and endears the loud to the centers of power. Indeed, today, the loudest people among us are those who are likely to do well when a party wins power. The ones who can insult the most are those who are heard the loudest by the president who wins the next election. We have gotten to a point where the incentives are wrong. And when the incentives are wrong, the action is equally wrong. This notwithstanding, it is generally agreed that bad speech in itself is preferred to no speech. For in the end, democracy is about divergent views, however abhorrent. The story is told of Frederick the Great of Prussia many years ago, 
who asked that a critical piece that has been published about him, but which was hanging high, should be placed in a manner that is more readable. While his intentions in the story is far from noble, his accommodation has been touted as an example in the pantheon of leaders who recognize the right of citizens to say what they will in a democratic environment. Elections are at the peak of the marketplace theory as they provide the means of a concrete expression of citizens' choice and opinion in governance. Elections allow for a definitive interaction between the citizen and their leaders and is designed as an instrument of accountability for returning leaders. They therefore enable a completion in ideas and compel creativity at various levels. In advertising, therefore, themselves and their competencies to serve, leaders submit themselves to questions interrogations, etc., and the citizen is benefited by the alternative choices presented, coupled with the abundance of information offered in the process. Yet, since its inception, elections have always tested the resolve of our country under the Fourth Republic. Often, the platform of elections has been exploited to reignite certain tensions that have always existed within the Ghanaian social fabric. Our chairman is an expert security personnel. Among these are tensions of ethnicity, often false, rivalry and hatred that is said to exist and persist among the various ethnic configurations of our country. Political actors exploit these, generate fear in each other, inspire us to be afraid of the other who doesn't belong to our ethnic group but who's aspiring for office and in need of our votes. Economic tensions. Tensions arising from a variety of economic factors, including access to resources, people not, people not, being, not being given the same entitlements as, as all citizens, simply because they are alleged to belong to the wrong political party, or in many cases, even merely suspected of belonging to the wrong political party. Hopelessness within the employment space. Many people are afraid that after elections, they are going to lose their jobs, and by reason of that, they are forced and compelled to engage in all kinds of things designed to help or assist a political actor often misplaced and often misinformed in terms of the basis of their actions. Power exclu exclusion or tensions in the area of power. The fact that when a party wins power, all others are excluded. So-called winner takes all. And by reason of which people will kill just to stay in power and others will kill just to gain access to power. The persistence of these tensions have implied that Ghana's democracy has in fact operated on two layers of foundations, namely a stable layer which generally endures and a semblance of stability during the larger part of the four years within which regimes are in office and the fragile layer which comes to the fore within electoral years during which period the regime encounters all forces of instability. The fragile layer reflects the ghosts of our past and how a lot of our political history has remained as we are in the past. Ethnocentrism has been, has been with us right from the very early days of independence. So has the politics of corruption and the rule of law. Any cursory review of a coups in our political history will reveal that, um, that many of these were staged on the back of allegations of corruption and the failure of the rule of law to uphold political office holders to account. While electoral violence has almost always been with us since the days of the UGCC and CPP, these have normally been dispersed, amateurish, and uncoordinated. Regrettably, in recent times, however, electoral violence has grown in sophistication, complexity, depth, and dynamics. Unlike in the, unlike in the early days of the Fourth Republic, the violence is now more deliberately perpetuated. Electoral violence is now carefully planned, organized and deployed by groups trained and skilled in the art of the business. Political parties have now come to expect to benefit from the activity and enterprise of electoral violence. The endurance of electoral violence has spurned a peace industry and this development reflects the quarterly security challenge confronting the Fourth Republic I spoke about earlier. 
the time is ripe in this lecture to consider some of the causes of electoral violence or heightened security, so heightened security threat during elections in Ghana. The following, among others, can be identified. One, polarized politics. Our political actors are entrenched in their positions, barely or hardly ever agree on anything, dispute everything said by the opponent, undermine each other, and will do everything it takes to destroy political opponents. Indeed, the diction of political actors is one that calls for worry. Often, political actors don't call each other partners, nor do they even call each other political opponents. They use the harsh word, enemies, our political enemies. Enemies are designed not to be friended with. Enemies ultimately are to be destroyed or demolished even when one has a capability or capacity. The diction in our politics demonstrates the entrenched, the entrenched position of our politics, and it probably is one of, the most, one of the most dangerous aspects of our politics that threatens the very stability of the Fourth Republic. Political actors see each other as enemies, and this enmity threatens to destroy the very fabric of our politics. Our political environment is therefore charged to the hilt, and is threatening to explode. The polarized character of our politics threatens and undermines everything called stability as far as our democracy is concerned. And it explains why political actors on different sides of the divide are very happy to destroy each other as much as they can. It explains why there's hardly any truth in our political fabric and it explains why even common sense has been politicized. Truth is only truth when spoken by your political colleague, not your opponent. The next factor which undermines our politics by way of violence is the issue of the convergence of political party ideologies. This position may appear counterintuitive on the face of it because convergence ordinarily is good and convergence should be accepted. But here's my explanation of why convergence has become a problem for us. In the early days of our Fourth Republic, the NDC prided itself, or prided itself of being a party that, has, that propagated and promoted social democracy. And therefore, the NDC was a social democratic party. I'm referring to, only to the two parties, the two large parties. The NPP prided itself in being a free market, free enterprise political party. These two parties, in the face of it, distinguished themselves on these bases. Then the Fourth Republic ruled on. After the end of the first regime of the NDC in 2000, the NPP came into office. The NDC, ironically, was the party that actually started the diversification or the divestiture of state-owned enterprises. The NDC pioneered and promoted some of the most capitalist policies of our country. A lot of the deregulations and a lot of you know, increments in prices, among others, initially started with the NDC. And that explains a lot of the, the demonstrations in the latter part of the 90s. The NPP came into office, and the NPP constructed and promoted some of the most socialist policies that you can encounter. The LEAP was supposed to have been an NPP, an NPP um, policy. The National Health Insurance was supposed to have been started by the NPP. You can, count, you can count and go on and on and on. The two parties appear to have merged at a point. And that measure is that both the NDC and the NPP are both free market economy, free enterprise parties, and at the same time, social democratic parties. The parties are in the moment and in the circumstances struggling to differentiate themselves from each other. Policy-wise, the parties are trying to distinguish the basis of their origins, and they are not only competencies, but actually their capacity to deliver better on those same programs that the other parties appear to speak on, or the, the, the party on the other side of the divide. Convergence has become a challenge. And part of the reason this has been, of course, we can ignore the fact that the World Bank and other international organizations are largely responsible for some of these things because they have funded policies and programs on the basis of certain um, institutional orientation of these uh, of these entities. So in that respect, it has become difficult for these parties to speak to Ghanaians on the basis of distinction. In my opinion, respectfully, that partly also explains our violence, that the parties are no more speaking to us on ideas. 
they are trying to outdo each other on the basis of fear. The next reason why we have, or we appear to have a problem in terms of um, electoral violence is what I call the politics of gangsterism. It appears that these days our politics reward people who make the most noise. Our politics appear to reward people who can destroy the most. Our politics appear to reward macho men. Our politics appear to reward strong men. Even though the famous statement of the visiting American president has often been repeated, that we should seek to build strong institutions and not strong men. I dare say that our politics has rewarded and continue to create strong men. And these are the people who are rewarded. Ideas are no more respected. And the one who has the best of policies is not necessarily the one most admired. In the circumstances of what we have, our politics have gone to the highest bidder on the basis of who can outdo the other party in violence. The final point, and I'll revisit this, the final reason why we appear to have so much violence in our politics, and this probably, in my opinion, is the most difficult one, is the politics of exclusion. The so-called winner takes all. In other words, when a party wins power, the party sees itself as having benefited from the toils of being in opposition. The party sees itself as, having, as the time having been ripe for it to not benefit from if you like, the resources of this country. And by resources of this country, that extends to employment, employability, that, employ, that, that extends to all other allocations that one can think of. By logic, any other person who doesn't belong to that political party or people who are perceived to belong to the other side are excluded. The concept of winner takes all speaks to the fact that the winner of an election enjoys, quote unquote, the booty. The danger of the winner takes all is that it creates a sense of political death for the loser. The loser of an election can be sure that for the next four years and possibly eight years and beyond, you may be in a wilderness that may mean the very essence of life and death. What that means is that we have heightened the cost of political power. The cost of losing political power is so high that death may be good in some circumstances. Now the effect of these is the gradual normalization of violence in our electoral politicking. And with that has come the weaponization of elections in Ghana. Opposing parties used or benefited from the perpetration of violence during elections and the forcible seizure and theft of ballot boxes that have been accepted as a reality of elections in, Ghana, in our country. For, for the so many years that I have been conscious about elections in Ghana, many ballot boxes have gone missing, never ever accounted for. It will be interesting for the electoral commissioner, or the electoral commission actually, to one of these days advise us of the political, or the history of ballot boxes that disappeared. Were they ever found? And if they were found, where were they found? And in whose possession were they found? And what happened after they were found? Often in the euphoria of elections, we forget the lost ballot box. And then the vote is counted and the, the results are declared because somehow, even if the lost ballot box is found, the results will not change anyway. But it may be important for us to find out where these lost ballot boxes are. Because in the minimum, and just to make fun of this, we can use those ballot boxes for, um, to ensure that our cities are clean. The effect of these, sorry, the risk of degeneration is always high, and the prospect of generalized electoral violence metamorphosing into a civil war situation is real. And a case study is just next door, La Côte d'Ivoire. If security is the foundation of a country's development, distinguished chairman, the logic holds true that its absence will undermine, if not stall, progress. Apart from the actual destructive impact of the violence unleashed, our country will continue to lose long-term capital in light of our quarterly cycle of chaos and instability. This cannot be allowed to continue and needs urgent remediation. To that, I turn my attention. The question may be put, are we likely to witness violence in the upcoming election in December? And my answer, regrettably, is yes. The near absence of good faith on the part of the two big competing parties makes this prospect highly probable. 
the ongoing accusations between the two parties and the refusal of the NDC to execute peace deals are ample testaments of what awaits us in the upcoming elections. Government's bold interventions following the incidents of the violence at Ayawaso is exemplary, but much more needs to be done in the area of anticipatory steps to deal with the issue of electoral violence in, the, in Ghana relative to the 2020 elections. I'll quickly move on to how prepared we are in 2020. Electoral governance. Our capacity to organize a free and fair election is tested by the electoral machinery, by the electoral machinery and the system we put in place. We have by and large done well in this over the years. Recent controversies surrounding the management and administration of the 2020 election is certainly a cause for worry. Starting mainly from the 2020 election, 20, sorry, starting mainly from the 2004 elections, electoral governance in Ghana has been characterized by substantial consensus between the leading players and the electoral commission. I will suggest that the EC should continue that practice by building consensus on, on key initiatives. This is especially critical given that the role of the EC as an umpire hinges on its ability to convince the players and the country that it is fair in its work. Therefore, it is, therefore, its substantive fairness must be matched by its perceptual fairness. That is balanced and objective in its judgment and actions. The substantive fairness of the EC is the fairness of the EC in its actual work. I'm confident the EC does what it has to do to be fair. I'm confident the EC respects the constitutional processes. As an institution that has kept Ghana together since 1992, I'm confident internally the EC does what it has to do. I have zero reason to doubt anything about the EC. The question is not the substantive fairness of the EC. The EC is an umpire, and like all referees, people must equally be confident in how you appear. The question, therefore, is the perceptual fairness of the EC. I'm confident the EC will do what it has to do in order to gain the perceptual fairness of people with whom the EC appears to have some difficulties in light of all the controversies ongoing. This advice is equally good for the parties, given that the obligation to consult, given that the obligation to consult must always be read in the context of the constitutional mandates of the EC to do the needful in the best interest of the country. For in the end, the election is not for the parties, it is for the country. This is a mistake we've made often. We have always assumed that the election is about the EC and the parties. The election is about Ghana. The parties have decided to organize themselves under the constitution. The EC has recognized the parties for their organization. The parties have met administrative requirements and in light of that, the EC has endorsed their participation in the election. The parties don't own the election. The one who owns the election are Ghanaians. The one who's administering the election on behalf of Ghana is the EC. Therefore, the EC owes the parties no loyalties. The EC owes Ghana all the loyalties. Therefore, what the EC has to do is what it has to do in order to ensure that the elections are free and fair, impartial, and that we have, we have stability. I would therefore urge that all the parties, all the actors, have a clear recognition of mandate. If the EC panders to the parties and does the wrong thing, Ghanaians will hold the EC accountable. If the EC doesn't listen to the parties and holds the elections and the parties fight with the EC through their members who are in their millions and there's instability, Ghanaians will hold the EC accountable. In all, the EC stands in the middle and it has to do what it has to do. Therefore, the parties must not only cooperate, but they must recognize the fact that the EC has a mandate. And in the end, the EC doesn't report to them. The EC reports to the people of Ghana. Policing and security. Electoral security is fundamentally a policing business. The police together with allied security entities like the army and no other is tasked with a mandate of proving of, or providing the framework of electoral security. For 2020 to pass the security test, the police need to be resourced and trained to meet the impending challenge. Yet I can't proceed further without touching on the obvious difficulty faced by the police in their attempt to deliver on their mandate 
of providing protection to the populace in enforcing the law. The irony is not lost on us, namely the fact that when the two leading parties are in power, they appear happy and, dis and deeply trusting of the police. When they are in opposition, they are very unhappy with the police and they are deeply distrusting of the police. The theory to deduce out of this simple scenario is that the political parties, when in power, appropriate or exploit the police powers of states to their private advantage. Hence, the police is truly their friend when they are in power. I'll tell you a funny story that I heard many years ago. That there was a story of a woman who conspired with her lover to kill her husband. And the story goes that the woman would drop a ladder, and when the ladder is dropped, she will get up and go to the kitchen. The lover will shoot the husband who's still waiting in the courtyard. In the olden days, people were in the courtyard. The, love, the woman did accordingly, went into the room or the kitchen, and the lover shot the husband. The husband died. The, woman, the man is not able to marry the woman. As they ate one day, the ladder, or the, the ladder, sorry, accidentally fell. When the ladle accidentally fell, the woman decided to go to the kitchen to bring another ladle. The man said, no, I'm going with you. Because clearly, that woman has demonstrated a capacity to kill the husbands using the instruments of ladles. I think that when parties are in opposition, they tend to fear the things they did when they were in power. And when parties are in power, they obviously exploit the very things they complained about when they were in opposition. The funny part of this is that none of the parties, at least the two leading parties, has come to the recognition that if we are in opposition and we get into power, we have, to, we have to ensure the house is in order. So when we are in opposition, that house we put in order can take care of us. And when they are in power, it's astonishing that they forget that they will come someday in the future when they may need the police to be upright. First, the police as an institution itself must have clarity on whom it serves. And I think this is a fundamental point. The police sometimes appear to have that confusion in mind as to whom it serves. And I've heard many people say that the police serves the people of Ghana and must not even take orders from the president or must not take orders from the executive. Well, I differ with that. Policing is an executive act. And in Ghana, and that's why the vice president is the chairman of the police council. The police ultimately have their loyalty to the government. And in Ghana, under the constitution, the government under Article 296 is defined as the executive authority, which is also further defined as the president. Therefore, technically, the police serves the president, which is OK. Because the president holds authority on behalf of Ghanaians, and the president has the mandate to ensure that you and I are safe for the period he's president. The problem is not the loyalty to the president. The problem is the loyalty of the police, apparently, to the political party in power. Now, while loyalty to the, to the government is constitutionally sanctioned, the police has no, serve, has no obligation to serve the parties. The, tendencies to the, to, the tendency to blur the lines between the party and the government has largely accounted for the suspicions by parties in opposition of the neutrality of the police service and allied agencies. When police officers or when the police as an institution takes orders from, police commanders take orders from party heads and leading party figures, then clearly we have a problem. It is a truism that a party makes the government, but when elected, they are separate, and the blurred lines between the two must not confuse the police. Mediating bodies. The success of the 2020 election will be largely dependent on the effectiveness of mediating bodies and adjudicatory institutions in dealing with the potential and actual conflict points that may arise. The Supreme Court has done fantastic in preserving confidence as far as electoral dispute is concerned so far. I'm confident that bodies or courts that are set up to deal with electoral disputes, especially the Supreme Court for electoral petitions, will still be active when the disputes are presented. When people know there's an opportunity for recourse to settlement, Settlement that inspires confidence. People do not fight. I dare say this, bearing in mind that the Supreme Court decision 
In the matter involving Nana Kufuado and others, and John Mahama and others, um, actually made a statement that has in many ways been construed by many people to mean that elections are won or lost at the polling station. Therefore, fight it out there. Many have construed that decision to mean that. In spite of that construction, I dare say that people will still have to resort to the courts, the Supreme Court, because any attempt to fight it out at the polling station to determine who won and who lost, when done illegally within the context of violence, the consequences of our criminal law will have to kick in once there's stability. These bodies, notably the Peace Council, has represented a voice of reason and calm during the turbulence of the election fever, when the heat and the noise of the moment tended to trump everything. I will suggest that the council, if not already doing the same, should map out the conflict points and strategize on cooling those points and or assuaging them. Given the experiences of the past, it will also help if the council deepen its engagement of the parties on their grievances and deal with them. The recent role of the council in the electoral register saga and the failure to achieve a consensus foretells of the challenges awaiting the Peace Council. A suggestion, could be, a suggestion could be to get the parties to submit to the council their own roadmaps of peace, which the council can then incorporate in its larger agenda. This would also provide critical feedback that will inform the council of the scope of complaints and the expectation of the parties as we go to the polls. My suggestion, I guess, is that it will be useful if the parties are made to own the peace process. If political parties submit a roadmap of peace, clearly in the process they would have identified areas of concern to them. They would have identified areas or issue areas in respect of which they seek redress and for which if nothing is done about the, there's the likelihood um, or, or the prospects for some violence. Because often violence occurs when people feel a sense of injustice. Violence occurs often when people feel a sense of no outlet for redress. When people have a sense of hopelessness, I think if people are made to feel that there's an outlet, and not just an outlet, but that they actually own the process, we are likely to have people comply with their own suggestions. And so this is a suggestion that I do hope the Peace Council may consider. Interparty cooperation. There's a need for the political parties to have common standards of behavior come elections. The parties have all said they do not own the vigilante groups. In fact, they will go ahead and tell you that these are groups that they have not paid a dime to. I'm amazed, in fact, that if this is true, the two leading parties have said this over and over again. And I've had the benefit and the pleasure of interacting with them you know, informally on different levels. And these parties who say this to you with the boldness and confidence that will inspire your belief. However, you ask yourself the question, if nobody pays these people, what is their motivation? Either they are paid by reason, either by pay, by reason of which they are motivated to work, or they work in expectation of payment. The expectation of payment does not have to be in cash. The expectation of payment can be in the character of appointments. Therefore, if I form a group tomorrow and my group is fighting on my behalf, I am paying that group. I am not the NPP or the NDC, but I'm paying that group. But I belong to one of these parties, assuming. Now, if I do belong to one of these parties and I'm paying that group, whichever of the parties I belong to when they win power, they have to remember that I paid people who did some work. And those people today must be rewarded. If they are not rewarded, I have to be rewarded for my investment. There is pre-electoral investment and people are investing in violence. We have to get to that point of realization and recognition and acceptance. And the distinguished chairman mentioned that. We can't play ostrich anymore. The parties must recognize the fact that we can dance around this. For party vigilantism will come back to bite someday if there's no redress for this. The militias of many countries that fell into civil war were people who were recruited in similar ways, who were playing boy scout role tendencies basically, area guys role, area vigilante role, all kinds of roles. And then when the chaos comes, these are the people who are ultimately armed. And we may get to a point of no return. I think the recent law is a good step. 
clearly there's a lot of work to be done. The parties must pledge and remain committed to ousting vigilantism and to yield out errant members. If the parties harbor these members and do not yield them out, and many of the party actors of both parties will say that they know them. They know the people, the macho guys who just pop out after every four years or whenever there's a by-election, then they show up. These are the people who come to the police station and bolt with the ballot box and the ballot boxes are never found again. The people know them, the parties know them, and not just know them, but tacitly endorse their actions until the parties recognize this and come to a point of acceptance that this act of vigilantism may bite its owner, just like the tiger who is hungry, eats the owner when there's no food to eat. You become the meat itself. The, these parties may become victims or may fall victims to political party vigilantes, um, vigilante groups if care is not taken and if they are not dealt with at this stage. Legal framework, legal framework and the criminal groups. The recent passage of the vigilantism law reflects the magnitude of the problem or the, viol or the problem of violence in Ghana's politics. There's a market space for organized violence in our elections, and so has the supply side been active. Wherever there's demand, there will be supply. There is demand for political party violence, so to speak, or violent groups either attached to the parties or even formed by active members of the parties. There's a market for these. These people are being maintained on the payrolls of some people. So long as there's a, there's, there's a market for them, um, which is supposed to be the demand side, there will be the supply side. Now, it's imperative for us to know that as a country, we have a major challenge in employment. All the governments have come up with policies designed to absorb the large numbers of people who are not employed. Therefore, if we have violence as an employment space, the many university students, the many polytechnic students, the many dropouts, and the many other people who simply have not found jobs will have to go into that space or will end up in that space because people have to survive in any case. There's an act or behavior, this act or behavior needs to be treated purely as a criminal act and enforced as such. Over the years, we've treated vigilante groups and their activity as a political problem. It is not a political problem. Indeed, it's a political problem because they challenge our stability um, as a country, but it is more of a criminal problem because these are people who go out there and unleash violence in simple terms. If you go out at this stage where we are now and you unleash violence on anyone, you've committed criminal assault and the consequences must follow. People have died in the past. People have been maimed in the past and we have simply treated it as a political problem and after elections, we basically just move on and leave people to their fate. I think we've gotten to the point where it has to be treated without any equivocation as a criminal problem and the people involved are properly punished. Effective policing and the enforcement strategies are needed to deliver on the enforcement of this. Part of the problem and part of the reason why the police appear not to have been very uh, active or very effective in this area has to do with the fact that the police look on these people as party agents. And on the basis of which of the parties are involved and which of the parties is in power, then again, there's a difficulty of level two. Shall we actually move strongly on these or shall we simply ignore them? I will respectfully call on the police to be active in this regard. And I have to be honest, on my way here, uh, there was an item on the news in which a, a leading police officer indicated that the police are battle ready, battle in quotes. They didn't say that, I'm adding it. But the police are ready for the ex suspected or expected violence of 2020 in December. Um, I was encouraged to hear that. I was indeed encouraged. But for the police to be able to do this, the police must visit the days of old, I think when the issue of where you belong to doesn't define whether or not you have indulged in criminality. When people have to be held accountable for doing things that endangers our country and all of us for that matter. The 2020 elections can only succeed if these lawless groups are kept in check and uprooted. The activities of these groups are mutually reinforcing in the sense that the success of one group incentivizes the other. The parties who benefit from their activities must come to the point of realization that they, and indeed Ghana, are the ultimate losers if they continue to allow and inspire them. In the minimum, it needs to be stressed that responsibility in leadership dictates that a person seeking office 
and for that matter, the high office of public service cannot aspire to, cannot aspire to it through the medium of violence and even death. People put themselves up to be elected as members of parliament, assemblymen, um, the president ultimately, and these people are willing to kill each other or kill people in order to serve. I think if we look at it from elementary principles, if I put myself up to serve you, I don't have to kill someone to serve you. The moment I decide to kill someone to serve you or even main people to help to serve you, I have indicated an intention which is ulterior. I think we have gotten to the point where our leaders must actually denounce political party, again, vigilantism, with all the force they can, because it undermines the very essence of public service. The essence of public service being an act of service and not an act of benefit by reason of which I must endure a risk. Public service is distinguishable from, you know, from the pr private enterprise or being in the corporate world, etc. In those spaces, you invest. The investment is a risk. You may lose everything. You may gain bountifully. But whatever happens, you've taken, an, you've taken a step which is risky in character. There's a sense in the risk. Public service, technically, nobody should take a risk because you are putting yourself up for service. And so if you are risking yourself to serve someone, then I, the one you are about to serve, should be skeptical of your motives. Citizen awareness. Electoral security is a collective responsibility. All of us are involved. And when the statement was made earlier, and there was a correction by the moderator, that asked not only what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, and I agree with him 100%, we must also ask what our countries can do for us. Because if we die uh, because there's no ambulances, and by reason of that, you know, we're putting taxes and in the, in the process we die, or we die because the roads are bad, or we get to the hospital and there's no electricity, um, all kinds of things, public goods that we expect the state to provide. And the state doesn't provide these. But the state expects us to constantly uh, be asking, or the state will be asking us what we are doing for the state. Then it becomes a one-way traffic. Um, I think that it has to be both ways. When President Kennedy of the US made a statement, I think he made it because he believed that the collectivity invariably reflects on the individual. And therefore, once the individual sows in the collectivity, he's actually sowing in himself. But when the collectivity is not reflecting the individual, then you have a problem. And so I agree with you, Mr. Moderator, in one way. But on this occasion, I'll still ask you, ask of yourself what you can do for Ghana in 2020. If you're a member of this country as a citizen and you participate in electoral violence, however minute, you, can't, you should not be proud to call yourself a citizen. Because vigilantism is, an, is antithetical to citizenship. In fact, I would have gone as far as to even stretch it to it being an act of treason, technically. Because if you indulge yourself in vigilante behavior, which is designed ultimately to overthrow the establishment through elections, in whichever form it is, you are challenging the very essence of the state. And the state has reserved the death penalty under Article 3 for anybody who does that. We have gotten to a point where citizen behavior must become responsible. But of course, responsibility can only go with awareness. The exploitation of the people as an instrument of violence is one that hopefully should cease. As we enter 2020, political actors are going to be recruiting people. Political actors are going to be using people. Citizens must become alert and must become aware of the exploitative behavior of certain political actors. If you are used as an instrument, you are nothing more than that instrument. You are not worthier than the instrument. You are just a means to an end. And none of us should lend ourselves to being used as a means to, as a means to a destructive end. The obedience to law and the respect for the electoral space as a security zone is a responsibility for all citizens. All citizens must respect the electoral space as a security zone. Um, I don't know whether this is something that should be officially declared. But technically, maybe three, four hundred years before the ballot box, or, any, or even more than that, should be a security space. The breach of which anybody, whether you're loitering around or whether you came to call somebody who is in the vicinity, the breach of which should attract the most serious of punishments. But often, we see electoral grounds, and sometimes you, see, you get a sense of too much laxity and too much playfulness around the ballot boxes. That explains also why we have loiters who occasionally are able to just bolt with ballot boxes which may never be found again. Investing in ourselves and in our elections as the ultimate means of expressing our political will should be the clarion call. All of us must invest in our elections. We invest our energies in our elections, 
We must invest our thoughts in our elections. As Star Ghana has even funded this program, we must invest our resources in our elections. We must invest, invest ourselves in our elections. Because the reality is this. The stability of Ghana, as I indicated, unfortunately, has been given a quarterly cycle. Before 92, we had a military regime. And for 10 years, there was stability. And one thing the military regimes have usually used against uh, civilian regimes, not just in Ghana, in many places. And that's why the semblance of chaos, the military will step in. The first reason is stability. They will mention stability, that they will not countenance instability. Now, we cannot accept this cycle of a four-year stability situation in which at the, at the tail end of the cycle, we must be worried about instability. And then fortunately, we'll scale through. We have actually come very close on one or two occasions. And we can't be constantly coming close and going through it. We have the opportunity to rectify that. Electoral violence, which is perpetuated particularly by the actors, is one that we cannot countenance or accept any longer. Government responsibility. Of course, government has the responsibility to provide a security space for this. I'm confident that government is going to direct all the needed resources to ensure that there is um, bipartisan or, if you like, neutral security uh, provided for all actors in the electoral space in this year. It is clear by, first of all, government is promoting the passage of the recent law on vigilantism, government, and then indeed setting up the Ayawaso Commission. Government appears clearly uh, aware and sensitive to the prospect of the risk of Ghana you know, having a difficulty in the upcoming election. And so I'm not going to make much qualms about this. I'm confident that government together with the full complement of all the security agencies and um, you know, heading, the, if you like, the, 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 the security apparatus of Ghana, government is clearly aware of the situation we're dealing with. Security, however, is collaborative and security is reciprocal. The reciprocity of the citizen responding to government security initiative is as important as the security deployment that is actually made out there. And it's in this respect that, again, citizens are called upon to cooperate or collaborate with, uh, with government. As I bring my statement to an end, um, I will conclude by saying that instilling a sense of hope and inclusiveness in any political system is a vital means to promoting not only stability, but also easing the high stakes and the cost of losing elections. For winner takes all creates an expectation equivalent to death for losing parties. And that explains the desire of citizens, sorry, that explains the desire of candidates and political actors to fight to the death in elections. We must begin to create the feelings of hope and opportunity beyond loss. We must begin creating the spaces for losing parties to feel that the next four years is not going to be death, that the next four years is not going to be dry. We must begin creating the sense of inclusiveness in our governance process so that people can lose elections but still feel a part and parcel of the entire process and the entire country. On the other hand, public service would only truly make sense if the servant who puts himself up for elections is truly chosen to serve. And not only when they have to fight, fist fight, and kill for the position. For when democracy thrives on violence, its actors train not in the art of conviction anymore, but in the skills of banditry. We are at that crossroads, when political parties, the citizenry, and government must unite in the cause of fighting the common threat of violence that haunts our evolving democratic experiment. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure we can put our hands together much better. Thank you so much, Lorena Escofi Abochi. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Extremely grateful for this. And, and the number of things that he said is something he's held on to for quite a while, over the period I've been listening to him. There are many who would also say that the, the, the justification for the establishment of the, of, of the committee or the commission, which you were the secretary to, is the outcome of your work and whether or not it was implemented otherwise. Okay, so I, I'm just saying. I mean, these are divergent views, which you know I'm putting across. I know you don't want to speak about it, but you, I, hopefully you can't resist the temptation. I, I know that for sure. Um, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who have joined us on television, on uh, TV3, 
as well as on 3FM 92.7 on the radio, Onia 95.1, and uh, Akuma 87.9 in Kumasi Connect 97.1 in Takradi and beyond, also on 3news.com, and uh, TV3 Ghana on Facebook, and DSTV channel 279. This is a Media General Election Command Center in partnership with Star Ghana, and we are talking about promoting stability, electoral violence, and the 2020 elections. It's a commemorative lecture, I call it a conversation, on the first anniversary of the Ayahuasca West Work on Commission of Inquiry. And you just heard our keynote speaker, Oyanes Kofi Abochi, Secretary of the Emil Short Commission of Inquiry into the Ayahuasca West Work on by Election, talking to us there. I'm going to go into the questions. I know we have a lot of it, but before that, I'll just run through a few institutions and individuals who are duly represented uh, to be acknowledged. I'll run through it and then we can put our hands together for them just to save time. The Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, Sharj, we have representatives from Sharj here. Okay, thank you. Um, Star Ghana, as acknowledged earlier as well, and uh, we have IDEC, Institute for Democratic Governance. Thank you so much. Investor of Ghana, um, also represented. Thank you very much. Uh, Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration, that's GIMPA, also represented NCCE. We also have representatives from the NCCE, and uh, our supporters, DFID and the UK Aid, Madame Clara Osebwating is here as well. And Rescue Mission International, also represented. Thank you very much. And uh, Security Analyst, Mr. Adam Bona, who has been one of our major resource persons on all our various platforms. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Mr. Samson Asakia Wingobit, who is nursing uh, the ambition of leading the PNC as his flag bearer, is also here as well. Thank you very much. And uh, definitely, he, 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 he didn't come alone. But I, I'm sure he didn't come with this other person I'm going to talk about. I think Mohammed is the convener of mass action movement. The name doesn't connote what they do. I'm just, it's just, <laughs> but it's also around, thank you, uh, General Secretary of the PNC. Thank you very much. Um, we'll go on to the questions now. So you put up your hand, the microphone's going round, and then we can um, 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 get, get on to it. But let me just take the opportunity to ask the first, while you pass on the uh, microphone to, to the, the first person, please. Yes. Um, so what you, you talked about the fact that I also, by election, is a microcosm to which we can see what is ahead of us. And then you also mentioned you know, the law that has been passed. But I have been of the opinion that if, if the laws that we already had before this law were implemented effectively, we wouldn't even be talking about it also as we're going by elections and the violence that characterized it. So how confident are you that indeed we, we, we are not going to come back talking about another commission set up to investigate the violence as a result of an election. That's mine. Please. You can please stand up, mention your name, and then you ask your question. Yeah, good afternoon. Yeah, uh, my name is Space Clote from Ododo Dio Dio. Uh, Ernest, uh, will you say that the the construction of our constitution, where the president has the absolute power to do anything except to change a man into a woman or vice versa. And the appointment of the Attorney General under uh, Article 88, where Clause 3 of the Constitution empowers the Attorney General to initiate and prosecute offenders. As we know, the Attorney General is appointed by the President and is a political figure. The police, the IGP is appointed by the President. And if you belong to one party and you commit an offense, of course, the party has to protect you. Therefore, the IGP and the uh, director of... Suppose I get the point. What, what exactly is your No, the question? point is that it's a problem with the Constitution. Okay. So That's why we are having this continuous violence since 1992 
and the serious one in you know, last year. Right. So, so is you, it the constitution? You want that to is address the, the constitutional yes. problem. Mr. Bona, okay, no, let's just get the next and I'll come to this side. Thank you. Mr. Bona, the, the microphone. Thank you. Oh, sorry, sorry. You can go on to the next person. Yes, please. Thank you. My name is Bismarck from Ayawaso West Wokon. I have a um, few questions to our resource person. To make a brief for me. Yes, one, I want to find out from him that the recommendation that they came out with, the president said they deviated from the terms of reference. I want to find out from him if really he believed in that statement. Okay. And secondly, there was appropriate compensation for the victims. As at now, nothing has been done. What is his advice to the victims, their families, and the government? And the last one, <laughs> the last one I want to find out from him. He made a comment or through a statement during his speech that the NDC failed to submit to a peace deal. If he can tell us, if the, he he knows something that probably the general public doesn't know right. about that peace deal. Thank you very much. Mr. Boshi, let's take this first set of four, I think. Maybe five, because there are three, two, one. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so about the new law, it is true that we are very good at passing laws, and we are not as good at implementing them. I think we all know this. The statement you made is also true to a point as to whether the existing laws could not have solved the problem. Because I mentioned to you, a lot of the issues surrounding vigilantism are straightforward criminality. I mean, criminal assault among others. But maybe the president or the government or parliament wanted to demonstrate its resolve. So what has been done is a more specific legislation. So we have general legislations, which is the Criminal Offenses Act, the general ones, and then we have specific legislation, which is characterizing the problem of vigilantism, which the commission called uh, militia, militias, yes, you know, no vigilantism, but the law still deals with it as a vigilante situation. So in that context, the law may be specifically zeroing in on, on a problem and trying to define things within the context of the emerging problem. And so the current law reflects, if you like, a deeper and a more broader approach to the situation of vigilantism as a specialized area of, a, of a criminality, if you like, as opposed to the criminal law which um, dealt with assault in the abstract or abstract in general. It ultimately still comes down to the question of implementation. And unless and until we have a police force that is willing to enforce it strictly, and then we have a prosecutorial system, which is again willing to prosecute seriously. We have so many laws in our books, we may not have the outcome that is expected. So that worry I share, but we probably want to wait till after December for the test, because at this stage, we have nothing to test it with. And nobody wants another hour so for us to check whether it will work. But until then, we can only hope that indeed, one, the law serves a deterrent purpose. You know, laws plays two roles. They play the deterrent role, i.e. make sure the thing doesn't happen by scaring people. So when they see it, they don't do what they have, they don't do the wrong thing. That, that's the deterrent role. And then the punitive role. The punitive role is once they have indulged in it, now you punish them for the misbehavior or the act of misbehavior. So that's your question. The second one, which has to do with the constitution and all the problems. Again, this is not something I have to bore your afternoon with because it's something that has been spoken about over and over and over again. The Constitutional Review Commission, it was one of the key recommendations. Um, Parliament was supposed to pass a number of them. I don't think much has happened. And so in that respect, you are just repeating a situation that I think very much everybody's aware of. And so I, agree, I share your point to a point. But again, your premise was a bit inaccurate. The president is not all powerful. The president of Ghana, constitutionally, is quite powerful, especially in the area of appointments. But the president is not all powerful. If our institutions were working well, the president actually is not powerful at all. Because if our institutions were working well, nearly all the things the president indulged, I mean, nearly all the powers the president exercises all those powers are curtailed by parliamentary checks. All those powers are curtailed by oversight. 
And so even though the president appoints the attorney general, the attorney general actually works both in the political space and also in a technical administrative space. The attorney general's department is made up of state attorneys. Now these state attorneys are professionals. So from the regular state attorney to the chief state attorney, these are professionals. The attorney general doesn't really direct them about in terms of uh, they doing things that may be considered legally blunderous. But of course, it is possible that the attorney general can decide to t take on a particular prosecution if he thinks, um, if, she, if he or she desires. And that could be considered political in character. So in theory, your concerns are true that with the political appointee, attorney general, prosecuting people, um, you may have situations where there are complaints about political preferences. I, I will give that to you, but it's important to stress the fact that the premise that maybe the president is, you know, can turn a man into a woman, that far from that. The president has powers, but all these powers are curtailed by constitutional strictures. The problem is these strictures are not properly exercised. And part of the reason for that, again, has been this political coincidence since 92 of the president or the party in power almost always having majority MPs. Um, who knows, maybe 2020, if we're able to get the classic skirt and blouse, as they call it, right? You know, if we get a classic skirt and blouse opportunity, we'll see. And we don't know which one will be the skirt, which is in uh, the <laughs> Flagstaff House uh, or Jubilee. And we don't know which one will be the blouse, which is in the parliament. So we don't know that yet. But hopefully that will present an interesting scenario for us to see the real cooperation between parties in terms of achieving the expectations and intentions of the framers of the Constitution. Now, the last one, if I am factually wrong, I, I'm happy to withdraw that, but my information was there was, a, I think, a peace um, council initiative for which a document was supposed to be signed. Oh. And I think one of the parties, again, ahead was NDC. If, I'm, if it's wrong, oh, I, well, yes, I But they, they had reasons for that. Right, that, that right, absolutely. It shouldn't necessarily be about both parties. Uh, they they wanted the conversation to be broader right. and have all the other political parties right. actually commit to the I use that to illustrate the point. I'm not making judgment on the propriety of it. So I hope I'm, I'm, I'm understood properly. I'm not making judgment on whether it was right or it was wrong, that it wasn't signed. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is it speaks of the absence of consensus. And that absence of consensus is an indication of what to expect. Because it tells us that the parties at this stage are not already seeing eye to eye on key roadmaps. So it was just a point I'm making. I'm not interested in the detail of whether it is proper or improper, because I really don't have the full facts in that regard, yes. Right. OK. Uh, Zabona, please. OK. Uh, there's, there's a question about compensation. Ah, sorry. Yes. Uh, so, sorry, if I can just take it, please. You know, again, my, I cautioned against this before I started, and I knew that this question would not be taken. So, since you have decided not to take my caution, let me also decide not to fully answer it. But here's what I'm going to say: the the findings of the commis commission is out there, so everyone knows it. You are right about recommendation for compensation. I have not followed up to check this. And I have to be honest with you, there's a reason people don't understand. There's a reason I don't want to speak about this. Look, commissions of inquiry are called commissions because you are commissioned. When you finish your work, you are decommissioned. That's what it is. So as I sit here, I was introduced partially as the secretary to the commission. I'm not. Because there is no commission. I was commissioned for a period. I have been decommissioned. Once you're decommissioned, you have no mandates. So I can speak as a citizen. I can speak as Kofi Abu. So I'm doing this now as a citizen, but speaking in a manner that compels me, and if I'm not careful, unwittingly forces me to speak as if my mandate continues. It's not only illegal and also unfair to my appointor, but it's actually misleading for you. So I haven't followed up. Once we finished our work, we presented our report, everything else beyond that was for the entity to whom our report was submitted and our work was done. So I'm, I'm sorry, but, oh, and okay. I'm honest, I'm serious about this. Right. I really don't know whether compensation has been paid. I haven't followed up. No, no, I think that's fair. To the extent that what, the implementation of the recommendations is upon your appointor. Is it the case? Correct. Correct. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know if I can ask the chairman questions as well. Um, yes. <laughs> 
Uh, yes, and yes. I'll encourage that. I'm sure Thank it, you. it could be brief. I understand we have just about uh, Mr. Chairman, 15 I'm, minutes. Yes, I'm, I'm sure most of us who work within the security space are aware of you and your good works you did. But we are, we are witnessing a scenario where we have a Minister of Interior and a Minister of State within the Interior Ministry. And those of us who follow elections and work with the security agencies will tell you that usually the interior minister would delegate his powers to the deputy interior minister to take charge of election issues and report to him. And so you have the election tax force chaired usually by the deputy interior minister reporting to his boss. At the moment, as we speak, 2020 elections, we, we don't really have a deputy interior minister. We, have, we seem to have two interior ministers. So I don't know whether, in your own estimation, this is right, since we are talking about stability. The other thing has to do with the speaker talking about hearing the police talking about, you know, they are battle ready for 2020 elections. And he said, well, they should be. But I say, no, they are not battle ready. There, there, there is a battle that is ongoing within the MPP. They are internal elections. elections and they, they are beating each other. Yeah, primaries. And nobody has been arrested. And we seem to have a certain vigilantism law passed which I said, I mean, I wouldn't use the word here, but it's unnecessary because it can never be used. And so I would have, I would have wished that probably you would have addressed that issue where we should have tested that law on the hoodlums who are beating each other, but that hasn't been addressed. The other thing which I would also speak, probably ask of from the chairman has to do, when he was the National Security Coordinator, eventually the National Security Minister. Was he giving daily briefings to the President? Because I believe, and which I know, which is true, that by convention, the President is supposed to be briefed daily, every morning, what the state of the uh, security is 24 hours ago, and how it's going to look 24 hours to come. But on the 31st of January, that's the Ayawasu West Wagon thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The president tweeted, and in his tweet, he said there was an isolated, you know, case of, uh, what do you call that? Is it violence? You don't term something as an isolation and end up setting a, a commission, not a committee, a commission and end up rubbishing the commission's work. And I did hear the executive is sensitive to these issues. I dare say probably the executive is insensitive. And so these are my own observations okay. and questions. Thank you very Sabana, much. Thank you. It's a, it's a load, so I'll ask that we answer them before I come back, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think the minister has ultimate responsibility uh, when it comes to the department. So the Minister of Interior will always have the ultimate responsibility. So when the relationship between the minister and the uh, subordinate minister, if I put it that way, is one of delegation. So I believe that the minister will assign, will delegate portions of uh, the duty in practice. I'm talking about issues as handled in practice. If there's a minister, he must take ultimate responsibility. Even if he performs other roles, he has a duty to report to the minister. And in terms of the law, the security law, there must be operational responsibility. And that means uh, the Operating agencies, the police, fire service, uh, immigration working under the ministry will ultimately have to report to the minister. So there cannot be any initiative operational 
policy coming from one side of it. Like the other subordinate minister independently working uh, separately from the minister. Okay, Mr. Poko, I, I think that the, the point I think Mr. Bonal was trying to make, um, just in summary, was that in this instance where normally you would have the minister, interior minister, delegate electoral security issues to the deputy. In this sense, as we speak, there's no deputy minister of interior. There's a minister of state at the Ministry of Interior. And I think that the concern is not so much about the office, or about the person, which I'm sure we was a bit silent about. But that's actually the issue. There is no deputy, but a minister of state at the Ministry of Interior. Is, is that we but, but we the, seem to have two ministers at that ministry. Yeah, so that's what I'm trying to say. And this is why I'm saying that in practice, there must be a senior minister within the same interior ministry. So that somebody has to report to one and another. And I cannot the I two think. ministers behaving as if they have separate functions. Now, if so I are you clear? Yes. <laughs> oh, yes, there must be. There must be the practical... If you have two ministers in an office, in practice, one has the responsibility of reporting to the president. Or so I think this is, there must be the practical side of the work. And uh, police being battle ready, that is uh, all that they are required to do in coordination with the various bodies. It can be electoral commission, and don't forget, the, the security services have to work closely with the other agencies. And as you see in the Constitution, we have the National Security Council, and they all uh, work closely with the coordinator, the who will report all the, the happenings, all the what you call the drivers of insecurity throughout the country. So they must alert the, to the police and other agencies as to all the build-ups in various parts of the country. So battle ready, not that they do what they want. It is based on the intelligence gathered throughout the country. Okay, so on the question of the... Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, Respectfully, I wanted to know when you were the security coordinator, were you giving daily briefings to the president? And my reason is that it looks like the president was not giving proper briefings the morning he was leaving the country when Ayawasu World's war gone has just unfolded. And his tweet actually suggested he was not up to date with our security challenges of the country. Well, generally speaking, I will not put any time frame to briefing. It's as and when. I can brief the president 10 times a day, depending on the happenings throughout the country or happening abroad. So the briefings are important requirement of that office. And it can go on several times a day, but in practice, the briefing, there are things happening. There are events throughout the day. And the briefings are very frequent. So in practice, all important occurrences must be communicated instantly. To your question about whether or not the law on vigilantism is necessary and whether it should be implemented, you don't believe in that. As a country, we've come a long way our lack of commitment and political will to enforce the laws of Ghana is well documented. However, I also believe in our capacity for repentance. As we speak, I have no reason to doubt the fact that come December, the vigilante law will be implemented. I have no reason to doubt. In other words, I have nothing that has given me reason to believe that it won't. At this stage, nothing has happened yet. The only thing that has happened is our future is our past doubt, which you're right about because you know we've had many instances in which I mentioned it in the presentation that political crimes have been assumed not to be crimes at all. That's part of the problem. The impression is 
if somebody does something wrong and the person's a political actor, because it's a political actor, well, then that's fine. I believe that if we come to the recognition that both parties stand to lose, as I indicated, if we continue with these vigilante tendencies, something ought to be done. I think not long ago, there was, there was an attempted prosecution or prosecution of some political actor. I, I'm, I'm remembering something faintly. But when the hilt, I mean, when, when, when the push comes to shove, Political actors of the highest order are sometimes forced to take decisions because there are political costs and consequences sometimes for not acting. Your own people can embarrass you, and I think it happens all the time. Your own people, you know, foot soldiers, as the chairman you know, referred to the media, your own foot soldiers can embarrass you. And so a point comes where sometimes the cost-benefit analysis is made, and the question is asked whether we shall continue on this path of non-action and not only embarrass ourselves, but jeopardize the very future of the country, I think something can be done. And so for me, the whole thing about the law, I believe that without the law, there were some existing laws. How adequate were they? First of all, the Criminal Offenses Act itself is quite old. So there are a few gaps here and there. This law obviously has done something that wasn't before. But the difference between this law and the existing law that was before it came into force will lie in implementation. I think we should give the benefit of the doubt for now, for December, for us to see how, as a country, would would implement this. Thank you very much. While okay. I plead that we make our questions very brief and straight to the point, I also plead with our speaker and our chairman as well to make the answers brief so we don't get too much into the night. Chief, yeah. yes, and then I'll take you and Mr. Duokbo. Okay, I'm, I'm Richard. Uh, a consensus is 